Hello, everybody. Can everyone hear me? Sounds good? All right. Hi, everyone, and happy Tuesday. I'm Teddy Andres, studio coordinator of uh, the sculpture here at Anderson Ranch Art Center, and welcome to our summer faculty lecture series. I am excited and honored to introduce Ron Rael and Rashad Taylor this evening. Both speakers will present for 20 minutes, followed by a 10 minute question and answer period, so we look forward to those questions. Uh, before we begin, I'll ask that you guys please silence those cell phones. Thank you. All right, so our first speaker tonight is Ron Rael. Ronald Rael is a maker of things in the world that blur the borders between architecture, art, design, and activism. He the, is the chair of the Department of Art Practice and the professor of architecture at the University of California, Berkeley. His work explores the frontiers of technology and the landscape of an expanded borderlands. He divides his time between Oakland, California, and his ancestral homeland in Colorado's San Luis Valley. Um, please welcome to the stage, Ronald Rael. Hi everyone. Hello. <laughs> hey, Rashad. Oh, there's me. Gonna go to the work. Um, three, three years ago, I did a project uh, that was an event. It wasn't, it wasn't meant to be a work of art. It was, I stuck three teeter-totters in the border wall between the United States and Mexico to have an event with families on both sides. And also three years ago, I started um, teaching uh, with Del Hero, uh, an advanced mentorship workshop here at Anderson Ranch. I'm going to talk really quickly about what I've been doing this last year since this project and where it's taken me a little bit, but also I'm going to talk about a project I've been working on that's about advanced mentorship and just some of my ideas from my sketchbooks and notes and the discussions with students in that workshop or workshop participants, I, I would call them. This is teeter-totter wall, and it's <clears throat> gone around the world in interesting ways. But one of the ways it's gone around is that people have wanted to see these teeter-totters. You can see it at the National Building Museum right now in Washington, DC. And you can even ride replicas of that teeter-totter. Um, you can see it right now at the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian in New York, but you can't ride it. Um, and also, last year in Lisbon at the... At the um, at the Matt Museum, they asked if they could replicate the teeter-totters. And you know, all, all this is very strange to me because the teeter-totters were meant to be this just moment event that lasts 40 minutes. <clears throat> and what it meant to, for a big museum to say, well, we want to replicate this. It has nothing to do with the border there. So we laid down a couple of conditions. We'd do it if they really showed the size and dimension of the border wall in all its violence. And also, they allowed us to use all that material to work in a kind of laboratory to think about what happens in a post-border wall world. Um, and so the idea was that one, one condition was we divide the museum in half with this. So people have to confront this obstacle. And it would, it would have every, the concertina wire, the steel, everything that, so people would get what's going on on the US-Mexico border that this is a site of violence, this isn't just a border fence, but it's actually a, a military installation of violence that causes death. And so the second part is, can we begin to make a house with this material? Can we imagine if we are optimistic enough to remove the border wall, what do we do with 800 miles of steel and concrete? And so now we're working with the museum and an organization to conceive of a house, and I put house in quotes because it's called teeter-totter house. And we're imagining a scenario where the wall itself becomes a house and transforms into a house. And so these are some of the models. Uh, but this project is being constructed right now. The foundations are being built for it. So it imagines a scenario where the wall transforms into a house. It'll be on a permanent installation uh, in a small town outside of Lisbon. And it'll be a place where the community can come and gather and be together. So rather than a place of division with these materials, it's become a place where people can come together. And because this idea migrated to, to Lisbon, 
we thought that we could think about that idea of migration in other ways. Like, for example, the mud oven, which you see in the front here, this little, mud, this little brown thing, that migrated to the Americas 400 years ago from Portugal. And so we're reintroducing it into Portugal, migrating back and be a place where you can gather around food and fire in this quote unquote house made of steel. And this is a place where, uh, in, a, in a park where people can come together and hang out in this. But another scenario is what can we actually do with the actual steel? And so when Biden took over the presidency on his very first day, he put a halt to the construction of the border wall. And so there are thousands of tons of steel that were ready to be used to construct a wall that were left abandoned. So I was able to acquire 10,000 pounds of that steel to ask this very question, what could we do with that steel in a post-border wall world? And so right now at the University of Arizona, um, I'm sorry, Arizona State University, we um, are exploring what it means to make what we call Casa Unida, a house united, where we've taken that 10,000 pounds of steel. And this, this steel is used to construct the bottom rail and the top rail of the fence holding steel together at a 45 degree angle. And we've used that to create an actual place of gathering within the museum. So this is, this is Casa Unida in the gallery. It, ha it has an entrance that welcomes you into Casa Unida made of, of local adobes, these are mud bricks that are made in Arizona. And so as part of that exhibit, there's two parts. One is called Casa Unida, and the other part is called Casa Dividida, House Divided. And about, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, I did a set of drawings exploring this, this actual event where the Army Corps of Engineers had planned the, wa the wall construction to go through a woman's house. And what does it mean for a wall to be cut through a house? And I made these blueprints imagining a house that's divided by the wall. And also thinking about this side as the average house, the average size of a house in El Paso, Texas, and that side, the average house of a house in Juarez, Mexico. And you see the different sizes of rooms, the different construction techniques, but in this case, the wall divides the bed in the bedroom. In another drawing, it divides the kitchen table. The idea behind these drawings is to demonstrate that these houses, I mean, this wall not only divides countries, um, but it divides cities, it divides communities, uh, it divides families. And so as part of this exhibition at, um, at ASU right now, we have the opportunity to construct house divided. And so this is, this is house divided. Um, it's a house that imagines a house that is cut in the middle, that is a borderlands house from the United States and from, from Mexico. And we migrated actual houses into the museum that are cut in half. And so you might see um, that it's, it's, a, it's a fairly realistic scenario. We worked with the Border Architecture Lab out of Juarez to, to bring these to the museum. Um, and everything is, is sliced right down the middle. The table is uh, sliced in, down the middle. Dishes are sliced down the middle. You see the, the photograph and the, the painting in the back of a house that's cut in half. And it's down to details of the newspaper that's used for the kindling, the light, the wood, and the stove, uh, the magnets, the mail on the table, the, the trash that accidentally falls on the floor, there's dog food, there's charging things, it's like, it's, it's a set in a way, um, and it's a, it's a really, I mean, for me, it was a really interesting project to think about how we um, bring these two worlds together and understand loss and separation, but also uh, bringing this kind of loss and separation and division into a similar space at the same time. And so one side is a kitchen space and the other side is a bedroom space. Other projects I've been working on are in my own community. And this is a project 13 years in the making, which is an enormous labyrinth that's connected to the Catholic Church, entirely made out of adobe. And so I'm ending in, these, in this last year, a 13 year project of building this project out of 40,000 mud bricks, more 40,000 adobes. Um, and this is in the San Luis Valley in a very small village of Conejos, Colorado. And 
the, the last project that I just completed uh, two days ago, three days ago, um, is at the Frontier Drive-In, also in the San Luis Valley. And so a lot of my work has to do with an idea of the expanded borderlands, because the San Luis Valley in southern Colorado was the northernmost frontier of Mexico and the United States. And so I think a lot about the lessons that are learned between uh, child separation today, the militarization of the border today, unfair labor practices today, and those same occurrences that were happening uh, in 1846 and, and prior to that at the historic U.S.-Mexico border here in Colorado. And so ironically, I'm working at the Frontier Drive-In exploring those ideas through Adobe construction, working with additive manufacturing technology um, at the historic border between the United States and Mexico. And at this Frontier Drive-In, it is a drive-in theater from the 1950s that is being restored. And they've invited several artists to do installations at that drive-in to be in conversation with the screen. And so just last weekend, we had a, a Borderlands Film Festival that I helped organize on the screen. And what I am doing is I'm building these silos that hold the sky. I call them skylos. Um, and they are 14-foot earthen silos that use additive manufacturing uh, for their production. Um, and so I've built in 12 weeks uh, 12,000 layers of mud that weigh 220,000 pounds of, of dirt uh, stacked together with a, a robot in this landscape to create an immersive environment where people can experience the sky, um, experience the sound of the theater, the, the, of the screen, the, the light of the desert, the light that em emits off of the, the screen itself, and that one can actually uh, use these as, as accommodations and stay in them. So my part is, is done. I've built these silos um, and I've printed these silos. What's coming next is an enormous water feature where people can soak in the center of these pools. There, there's gonna be a, a bed platform or a sleeping platform, a laying platform where people can spend the night there um, and a changing room. So they're in units of two and it's these enormous earthen structures that collaborate with, with the sky and the environment. And so I just wanted to show that very quickly and that's what, I, what I've been up to. Um, but I did wanna spend the second half talking about um, and so here, here are the places where some of my work is if you want to see it, and you can, a lot of the work I show on my Instagram account. But the second, the, and maybe the last project that is wrapping up uh, this three-year endeavor of this advanced mentorship studies program that I co-teach with, with Del Hero is um, a series of notes about how to be a mentor. I think Del and I often discuss this idea of what does a mentorship program actually look like and what does it mean to be a mentor. I'm a professor at a university and I have always felt like my role has been a critic. And I teach design so I think a lot about what makes good design. And when I came here, I wanted to wonder how, you know, how I could communicate to the workshop participants what might make good art. And what I, what I discovered through the conversations with the students is that what makes good art is really a question that is the role of the critic, um, but, and not the role of a mentor. And so that question, what makes good art, is kind of a question that comes from a lot of maybe certain experiences that I may have, but ultimately their, their opinions. I might be able to share uh, with, a student might share with me what they're making and I might offer an opinion and that's inevitable. But I, I was wondering that maybe a different way to frame it is to ask the question, what makes art good? And I think what makes art good might be the role uh, or the question that's asked uh, by a mentor. And, and why is that? Um, well, in, in the case of what makes good art, I think about, <clears throat> just let's look at it grammatically for a second. And that, that good in this case is an adjective. And so it, it sort of says, well, the art is good. Why is the art good? Because maybe someone said so. And why did it say so? Because there's a series of experiences. But what makes art good, uh, good in that case, is an adverb. And it modifies the word art. 
And so I was curious about, you know, what are the modifications that one might do as an artist to their work that might make it good? And so in my notes, I, I want to share with you some of my notes because I think that, you know, whether you're a practicing artist or a fan of art or you simply visit a museum or a gallery or stumbled upon a piece of public art somewhere, you might have asked yourself many questions about artwork. I think so, a lot of you have those roles in this audience. And one of the most profound questions you all may have asked when you're viewing art or you think about your own work is, is this art any good? Or you may have already judged it as either being good or bad. And so that determining that answer when trying to determine whether art is good or not can be kind of complicated. And there are many reasons why one makes art, why it gets chosen to be displayed in various venues, uh, how it is made and what makes it good enough that it has found a place in the world outside of the artist's studio. And so I wanna make sure that it's very important to point out that, it, that my definition of good is that it has the capacity to leave the artist care and find a home someplace. So in these last three years, I've been trying to decipher through my conversations with the workshop participants, what makes that art good enough to have found a home in the world? Because I felt as a, mem as a mentor, we have to have conversations about thinking about how to get the work out in the world. And doing that by defining attributes that art has to allow the creative work of an artist to transcend the space in which it was created and to find a home somewhere in the world, be it in print, like a book, a magazine, a journal, a gallery, on the internet, in a museum, or in the landscape, like a public artwork or a commissioned land art piece. And so one way to answer this question, what makes good art, is quite simple, I think. And it can be answered by asking a single question, like does the art have impact? And following a bit further on that question, I think one should ask why, where, and how, and when does the artwork have impact? And while this is not an easy question to answer, and there are certainly a myriad of set of reasons that can alter our perspective of what is good art, I think there are two basic sets of criteria that, that I've discussed with the workshop participants that define good art. And so the two criteria I've defined are internal criteria and external criteria. Internal criteria is what I call um, the criteria that an artist uses to define a work of goodness for themselves personally. That internal criteria can be really varied. An artist might feel that they've accomplished something particular to their thought process or craft, or the work might just simply make them happy. Their friends or family might compliment them on their work, giving them positive reinforcement that fuels their practice or making the work might fulfill a fantasy or passion that the artist has. And all these are internal criteria and more might allow an artist to make them feel that the art is good for the artist internally. But my endeavor in this mentorship program has focused on what I call external criteria because the assumption here is that good in this context is work that is external to the artist's sphere. And again, the work has found a place in the world within the many contexts that work of art can be shown from a coffee shop to the Louvre. And I don't suggest what makes a good venue for, <clears throat> for art to be shown. Um, uh, you know, there's no judgment between whether the work is in a coffee shop or the walls of a major international museum. I simply acknowledge that the work is no longer under the auspices of the artist because someone else recognized it and put energy towards having it find visibility and safekeeping elsewhere. And so it's by this definition that I define the impact of an artwork and what makes art good. And again, art can have lots of kinds of impact. It can be widely recognized, reach wide audiences, be represented in major galleries, be published in important journals, magazine, newspapers. Critics might write about it or it might make local news. Um, museums may acquire or show work. It may find an audience in special places. It might be a pilgrimage site that people travel to or become an art tourist attraction or it may be stolen or purchased and locked in a vault because it's perceived to have a value. And so <clears throat> this is an attempt to define attributes that make work have impact. Uh, what makes work special and what makes work stands out. In other words, what makes good art or what makes art good. Um, <clears throat> and so I, I said this before, but in other words, what modifies the work such that it is perceived as good? I use the word modify because if we look at the sentence again, 
that good is a modifier. And if there's uh, grammarians in the audience, they're going to say, well, good isn't really an adverb because that's grammatically incorrect. But uh, it's kind of a colloquial adverb to say what makes art good. It's not really a, 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 a correct sentence. But I've broken this external criteria categories of good art into 26 attributes, what I want to share with you. And a single attribute doesn't necessarily make the art good. Sometimes it's a combination of attributes. Um, and often, a good work of art contains a combination of these attributes, as a good work is often, often layered and complex. So nevertheless, one-liner is work that is singular in a simple meaning often does get recognized because of its accessibility. So here, here are the 26, and I'm going to go a little bit fast because I'm slightly over time, but one is it's a spectacle. This is one of the easiest entry points into work when the work is a spectacle. Spectacle is defined as something that is visually striking, a performance or display, or is an event or scene that's regarded in terms of the visual impact. This may have to do with the absurdity event or the nature of which it shocks you. It's an experience. It could be something that you inhabit or occupy. It could be spatial, like a Richard Serra, or a VR 3D experience. It could be immersive, like a house of mirrors. Um, <clears throat> Experience have taken a new role in museums, and they require sometimes special tickets at museums today by how long you can experience them. Uh, Random International's Rain Room, for example, from 2012, was an immersive environment of perpetually falling water that pauses when the human environment is detected. Um, so visiting these works constitutes part of the experience. A visit to Donald Judd's work in Marfa, Texas, requires one to travel several hours through the West Texas desert to get to the Chinati Foundation, where the works are on display. So part of the experience of viewing Judd's work is traveling through the desert to have a deep understanding of the landscape, which are reflected literally in the hundred entitled works of milled aluminum on display there. It's extremely well crafted. This is work that is so well-crafted and exceptional, it re redefines how we understand craft. An oft-repeated cl cliche about art is, I could do that when you see a work of abstraction or simplicity, but the, the attribute of craft when done with great mastery defies anyone's ability to believe that they could accomplish what the craftsperson created. It creates or responds to a controversy. Some work creates controversy, and some work latches on to controversy. The topics of controversy are as varied as controversy is, but generally it is divisive and polarizing and creates discussion marked by opposing views. It represents an innovation. It defines something new or employs something new or had the ability to generate something new. One ability of this is Vanta Black, known at the time as the blackest black paint, absorbing so much light it appears as almost a flat nothingness. Um, and which was exclusive media to Anish Kapoor. It is a counterpoint to what exists. So Kapoor's exclusive license of Vanta Black proved controversial, sparking this year-long feud with this other artist, Stuart Semple, a British artist who has since set out to liberate colors from private ownership. Having created several of his own coloriest colors, uh, Semple made them available to anyone in the world except for Anish Kapoor, including the blacker black than Vanta Black and the pinkest pink. <clears throat> Familiarity is turned upside down or made unfamiliar. Perhaps Duchamp's fountain, ready-made toilet from 1917, is the most famous example of this. I think Jeff Koon's balloon dogs or Nicholas Galen's Indian land or works by Klaus Oldenburg represent this kind of familiarity. It is clever or no novel. This might be a subsection of innovation, but it leans towards wit. Prada Marfa might be an example of that. It creates opportunities. Social practice, art teaches others, enables, protests, incite changes. I think of Rafa Esparza's Brown Matter at the Whitney, where he brought in brown artists, and he made the Whitney floor into an adobe gallery that was brown. Someone famous made it. Famous, famous artists have momentum that allows all subsequent work to have a greater chance of success. But even non-artists who are not famous have this advantage. George Bush became a recognized painter after his presidency. It is made or found in a special place. It represents the zeitgeist of the time. It is newly discovered. It knows its audience. It shocks. It has historical significance. It contains someone or something famous. It is well designed. So design solves problems and how to make an easy to open door handle or create a building that accommodates its users or responds to environment, that's design 
and design can be artful, but art isn't design. Uh, art has to be designed, and so sometimes work has to be designed. I think, I think about work like Levitated Mass at LACMA, which is just a big rock, but it's moving that 120 ton rock from Nevada to Los Angeles, demanded a ton of design coordination, engineering, architecture, uh, to, to make that coordination possible. It's part of an evolved and iterative process that demands quantity to produce quality. Work doesn't come simply. You make it over and over and over again, and then it gets better. It's part of a story or a legend. It probes the fringes of what's possible. It steals. Some art copies the techniques, processes, aesthetic, or ideas of art that is already considered good. Some is calculated as forgery, and other times the work is a lack of creativity or imagination coupled with technical skill. The work builds on innovation of others to garner attention or attempts to be passed off as the work of the original innovator. Cultural appropriation is also a form of this. Sometimes it is conscious and the other time unconscious. It copies, it riffs on the work of well-known good art. Someone or someplace important said it was good or recognized it was good. It could be a, an important critic, a journal, brought into an important collection or displayed someplace important. It's back again. Its creator went to a good school. <laughs> and my last one is, it teaches you something. So by no means are these 26 attributes the only list that make good art. I absolutely encourage you to come up with a list of your own. So thanks for coming this far. And I want to say thank you to the workshop participants and for Dell for teaching me what makes art good. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Ron. That was amazing. Um, next up, we have Rashad Taylor. Rashad is a contemporary photographer whose work is in a window into the black American experience. Taylor attended Murray State University and earned a bachelor's degree in art with a specialization in fine art photography. Most recently, his work was acquired by the Museum of Fine Arts Houston for his series, Little Black Boy. He is also the 2021 recipient of the Arnold Newman Prize for New Directions in Photographic Portraiture. Taylor is working on a series, Little Black Boy. He documents his son's life and his own anxieties of fatherhood in the face of a society confronting enduring prejudice, injustice, and racism. In this ongoing long-form project, Taylor addresses themes of family, race, culture, and legacy through portraiture. Large and medium format process Favored by the artist is a contentious nod to the gravity of content, content and intention of frame. This format also disarms subjects by slowly, sl slowing time and heightens tension by raising intimacy. Taylor's editorial clients include National Geographic, Essence Magazine, ProPublica, among others. His work has also been featured in CNN, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, BuzzFeed News, Feature Shoot, and Lens Scratch. Rashad Taylor lives in Springfield, Missouri with his wife and son. Please welcome Rashad. Oh, this thing is shaky. How's everybody doing tonight? Okay. I'm gonna take a quick selfie if you don't mind. Like, so I gotta get my, my IG followers up here. So everybody, can you, uh, wait, oh, there we go. So everybody, oh, I could get, hold on. There we go. So everybody smile. Oh, wait, let's do this. There we go. All right, one, two, three, yeah. Wait, let's turn it this way. Oh, there we go. All right, perfect, all right. <clears throat> Had to get that out of the way. 
get my timer set up here. Thank you for the introduction. And I am honored and privileged to be here. So big shout out to Andrea Wallace. I don't know if she's even here. Um, and uh, oh, hey! And, uh, and, um, and Esther Nooner. So I really appreciate them inviting me to the ranch uh, last year. So this is my second year here. And I'm teaching a wet plate class, Introduction to Wet Plate, which has been amazing. And today I'm going to have an artist talk, obviously, here. So I wanted to kind of dive into two of the ongoing projects that I'm working on um, and just kind of tell you a little bit more about them, how I started. A um, little background about me. I'm originally from Bloomington, Illinois, and I currently live in Missouri. Uh, and I'm trying to think of something fun. I like Buble ice cream. That's the best ice cream ever. So if, you, if you're from the South, you'll understand. Um, so I wanted to start off with this. Um, I'm here teaching a wet plate class. I have had a, I'll tell you a little bit about my wet plate journey. Um, so wet plate collodion is basically the second photographic process. So it's after daguerreotypes. And essentially it's about you know, it's a process that you take some kind of substrate, um, tin, glass, aluminum, you know, kind of whatever you had, want, and you uh, coat it, synthesize it, and expose it and develop it, all within about 15 minutes. So um, it is an amazing process, very cumbersome and tedious, and you can ask any of my uh, students how much they love it right now. Um, but uh, so I really fell in love with it back in 2012, uh, I saw the work of a wonderful artist. Her name is Joni Sternbach. She shoots uh, portraits of surfers. So I saw this book and I'm like, wow, these surfers are amazing. Like, I want to do that. So I was in Illinois at the time. I found this gentleman right here who's pictured. This is probably one of my first uh, tent. Uh, actually, this is an Ambrotype. Uh, his name is Dale Bernstein. So Dale is out of uh, uh, Indianapolis. And I found his workshop, it was a weekend workshop. The cool thing about Dale was that he assisted Richard Avedon and I think he printed for um, Irving Penn. So that was kind of cool. So had a lot to talk about when you talk about the photography masters. So uh, just really love this process just because it kind of got me back into making things with my hands. I had, you know, I shoot, Obviously, I shoot mostly all analog, but at the time I shot some digital, and just like any average person, you probably have thousands and thousands of photos on your hard drive, right? Or on your phone. I know I have about 30,000 pictures on my phone right now. So I wanted to get back to art making and making these one-of-a-kind pieces. So I, you know, do portraits, and that's kind of how I started. Uh, found my rhythm in just portraiture and exploring that, really trying to get the process down. Uh, just because it's pretty challenging uh, to do so. Uh, so portraits, friends, family, this is my father-in-law. I call this a Dominican cowboy because he's Dominican and he has a cowboy hat. So, <laughs> And you'll notice my, uh, my uh, titles are pretty amazing, by the way. <laughs> it's okay, I can make fun of myself. But uh, So, yeah, this is a start. Let me tell, talk about this transition here. So, been making photographs, and I kind of, and, and with wet plate, I wanted to do more, right? I wanted to make portraits that meant something, portraits that kind of were a representation of what I was feeling um, as a black man, a black man in America. And um, I'm into history, and I did some research, and um, on the left, um, is Frederick Douglass. So Frederick Douglass obviously is an abolitionist and in the 1800s. And I think the thing that I was really interested in was the fact that he was the most photogra photographed person in the 19th century. So there's over um, 160 portraits of him. Oh, he sat for more than 160 portraits, right? And the interesting thing about it was this was for him. The reason he sat for those portraits was really he looked at photography, and I do the same thing as a tool. You know, photography is a tool to communicate, to educate, to um, really shed light on areas that people may not have a viewpoint on and to challenge others' viewpoints. Um, so I felt like for him, he wanted to portray a uh, distinguished, dig he wanted to show dignity, he wanted to show an accomplished black man. He wanted to show that 
you know, black people can be powerful. He wanted to show all of these things because you have to remember that this is back in, you know, the 1860s, 1870s. You know, he was born in 18, 18 or 1817. They don't know exactly which date, um, but it was powerful because up until that day, no one saw a black person other than a slave, right? So if that's all you see black people as, as slaves, then this is contradictory to what that narrative is. And that was a reason why he wanted to be photographed. And I, I just really understood that photography is, is, is power. Um, the next image to the right here, uh, it's, it's been called a couple different things, either you know, whip Peter, scorched back, but um, I'll summarize the story due to time. Essentially, he was a slave and he was beaten so bad that you know, obviously his scorched back. Um, hence the title. But the real interesting part about it is that um, when he was photographed, he was photographed by medical, because um, obviously he ran away and they photographed him um, in the hospital, and these photographs were spread out everywhere because this is in 1863, uh, right around the Civil War. So what these pictures did of the scorched back gave people in the North even a better idea of, well, what's slavery really like? You know, they, they didn't know. They, there was nothing to inform them. There was no, because their narrative was skewed by whatever people in the South wanted them to know or look at, right? You know, not saying poking fun of today, but you know, there's a lot of narratives out there. Um, but, but this was the truth. And going back to my original point, photography brings truth. Photography brings power. So with this series that I've been working on, um, also a big influence, Gordon Parks. And I'm really into like, America and flags and um, what that means. Uh, so with that same thread, um, you know, Gordon Parks obviously is an amazing hero of photography and just the juxtaposition in this image um, called American Gothic, oops, let's go back, called American Gothic, um, you know, it's contradictory. You have American flag and you have this person who, this woman who is, you know, the lowly of lows, right? And I think for me, I wanted to incorporate all of those items within photography as power. Photography is there to get a point across, is to illuminate um, a thought, right? So I started to make these portraits of the series called My America, which is really more of a uh, investigation of you know my experiences, but then even bigger than that, just what's it like to be black in America? And what's it like that um, other people may not understand totally or not have the opportunity to have that understanding, if that makes sense. So this, is, this um, piece is called um, The Past. So just kind of a, obviously when you go back to the what Peter, I, you know, I looked at that image and, and made this one and I wanted to kind of just show you know, what that past, that dark past looks like. Um, and this is also, so this is the eight by 10, uh, tintype. So let me back up real quick. So I shoot mostly tintypes. Tintypes are, I shoot my tintypes on black and aluminum, uh, typically an eight by 10 size. Uh, they're all, I also sh photograph a little bit with ambrotypes, which are glass um, with the collodion on top of it. So same process, but just different substrate. Uh, this is titled um, uh, The Present. Uh, so, right, this was made in 2018, so right around the time of, um, oh gosh, well, it wasn't the exact same year, but beforehand when I think about um, Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, Freddie Gray, I mean, there's so many names that, um, you know, the list can go on that impacted me, right, because these people look like me and they're you're getting shot down. Um, so this is kind of in a response to that. And again, just, just the pose on the American flag. Now, the thing about America, it's interesting because I think that these images kind of challenge your view of America a little bit. I mean, that's the goal because, you know, I do like America. Don't get it wrong now. So I'm a, a proud American, but it's just this contradiction and this really interesting dynamic when you are black in America. And these images explore that. Um, let me go back real quick. So this one is called, this is one of my favorite ones, um, the future. Uh, so this is my son, LJ. Uh, but I feel like there is a future. It is, I feel like I am an optimistic person. I'm not, you know, doom and gloom or whatnot. But 
I, I do think there's light at the end of the tunnel, you know. Um, I sometimes incorporate, you know, um, like African, like this necklace is African inspired, uh, going kind of back to the roots of, you know, where we come from. Uh, yeah, I mean, so a lot of this work has just a lot of different commentary. Some commentary I talk about and some I kind of just want the reader to think about. Like, I don't want to give them, you know, the reader too much information. It's kind of like, hey, just absorb it. What does it mean to you? Um, still life. Gotta love the guns. I live in Missouri now, too, so there's a lot of guns in Missouri. And then this one, I, this is kind of the ending piece of, well, not the ending piece, it's kind of a transition. So this is just called, um, it's just an American flag, but I purposely, you know, scratched and, um, you know, redevelop the tent type and just worn it down and just to want to show like the tattered nat nature of the flag. And then I kind of went through a little bit of a, you know, I kind of got tired of shooting in the studio a little bit and um, I had the opportunity to shoot an assignment for National Geographic. Um, it was based off of the series, so I kind of took two lenses of I shot for the story, but then I shot for my own work, right? So you always want to shoot for yourself sometimes, too. Uh, so this is at Marietta National Cemetery in Mar Marietta, Georgia. So my, and, this, and the whole theme here is black military service. So my family, uh, my great uncle, Lucky Taylor, served in the military as a uh, medic in World War II. And this is where he's buried. So um, wanted to just show the expansiveness of all of these fallen soldiers, you know, it's just, I just love the, the landscape here. Um, but moving forward, like with, with, when you think about black military experience, that experience, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Um, just because you have a group of people who are giving up their lives for a nation that in most of history has not cared about them. So when you think about the sacrifices that people of color had made for the United States, it's, it's kind of sobering. It's, I, I mean, I take a step back and like, so this is actually my, my cousin um, who's a sergeant in the, in the Army. She did two tours, um, I think Iraq, Afghanistan, um, and she's a medic. She's a medic also, like my great uncle. And I just love this image. I'm, I don't think she was crying, but just like the the water in her eyes, it's, it's just really surreal and just sobering, right? Because that's what they're doing. You know, my uncle, you know, he would serve in the military, but then come back to Jim Crow, right? He would come back to segregated South. He would come back to maybe being a second class citizen. So these are the things that are kind of intriguing that added to my, um, to this project, because that's just another thread that I wanted to, to attach. Um, and these are my little cousins. It's very intense. This is, yeah, they, they did a great job uh, on, on that one. Um, so they're, so they're my, my cousins, but then they're, so their father served in the Air Force and his father served in the Army. Um, so it's just a lot of family ties. And so it does get real personal for me with this, you know, this section, but um, I think this might be the final one. And that's my cousin at, this is in, Georgia still at the, this is the Army National Guard. So this cousin is in the Army National Guard. The other one uh, was in active duty. All right. How am I doing on time? Let's see here. All right. Got seven minutes. All right. So that was my one series I've been working on for a while. So that's ongoing. Um, the next series, uh, which some of you may be familiar with, is the Little Black Boy series. So this series... Um, started at the birth of my son, really, so about seven years ago. So this is the image that kind of started it. Um, and I'll kind of go from the beginning. So going through, you know, being a first-time father, um, you know, and a photographer, you always take pictures of your family, obviously, right? Your sons, your kids. Um, and that's kind of how it started. Um, I started to notice as I went through and made more pictures that there were different threads that I wanted to, to look at because I kind of thought going back to the thread of like a narrative, 
is the fact that, you know, we don't see a lot of positive images of black families, especially fathers and sons, or sons, too. Um, this, this image was really tickled me just because uh, if, you, if you look real here at, at his hand, so he had to be about six months, oh, maybe eight months, and he's holding my wife's, you know, nightgown like, hey, dude, this is my woman now. You're, <laughs> you're on the couch, buddy, you know? So, so uh, yeah. And it, and it pretty much is, though. He, he's, mama, he's definitely a mama's boy, so um, as you can see in the next photo. So a lot of these photos are just more documentarian. You know, I shot with the Leica. I, you know, brought it to family functions and, you know, pretty much just documenting his life. But then I started to, to notice these different threads and that I wanted to explore, like, you know, he has a shirt, Dream Big, and here's a police shield and this little girl in the background. So I just thought some of these things were interesting to kind of explore more. Um, and then it kind of morphed to portraiture. Um, and then as it morphed, I kind of, I, I took it, I just took it more seriously, right? So I moved to medium format. Some of the images, so this is a medium format shot. Um, this was, he was four years old and, you know, just laying in my bed. Um, isolation, I think about. And then it kind of hit me a little harder and I said, okay, I think I might have something here. I, I want to explore this a little bit more. I want to show what this, you know, black life is as a little black boy because you just don't, don't see that. So in the images, I'm documenting just kind of everyday life, you know, everybody dresses up as Superman, you know, everybody hides, and oh, we're playing hide and go seek, yeah, well, we're gonna capture that, because we want to capture that joy, that black joy, that those, those um, moments, those tender, loving, caring moments that you just don't see, you know, that's important to me, and to document him in this light, I felt that, you know, it can have a lot of meaning, and it, it, could, go, it could go somewhere. And then at the same time, with the images, I, I really wanted to layer them. I wanted to layer them, the meaning of them, where you kind of have to look at it for a little bit. You need to sit with it. Like when you're in a museum, you, you need to kind of sit with the art. You need to, you know, explore it. And some pictures do that, some pictures don't, but that's really my goal. So for, like, for, for instance, this image um, called Deep Sleep, you know, on the surface, he's you know napping, sleeping, you know peacefully. But for me, it, it's more of a. It, it was just more of a thought of, hey, this might be a post mortem look at my son, like in the world we live in. He might not outlive me, and it was me really coming to grips as a father about that and that reality and thinking through like, well, crap, like that's real. Tamir Rice was 12 years old when he got shot down by the police with a toy gun. Like, that's not that far-fetched for my son. And I think for me, with the work, it's, I'm kind of on the stand too, right? I mean, there's images of me and him, and I feel that it's really, you know, helping me work through just being a father um, and how to raise a black boy um, into a man in this country, right? So, you know, a lot of the images, I, me and, and him and then my wife and him, I like this dip trick of, of us. Um, yeah, I like to use light a lot too, just to kind of, I, I like how the light here on the left picture is sculpts my, my eye there, that's nice. And I don't know, I just try to find light and use that in normal settings, because obviously most of these images are, you know, in and around our house, um, at friends' homes, um, different locations. Um, this was just another self-portrait of him sleeping. Shout out to the New Yorker, they like this one. Yeah. Um, this, so this is best, I call this best bud. So this is funny, so this is an interesting relationship between um, Ki uh, grandkids and their, and, and their grandparents, right? So I'm in this life now that I have a seven-year-old and then my dad's in his 60s. And it's so interesting how their relationship is. And I feel like parents, and I know there might be some grandparents here, like I really feel that they're trying to get back at the kids. Because like I would go to their house 
And, they, and he'd be like, Daddy, Grandpa get, Papa gave me uh, ice cream for breakfast. And I'm like, ice cream for breakfast? What is this? Like, I never got ice cream for breakfast. We get scolded. You get hit upside the head. Like, what? Um, but it's just interesting. But their relationship is so beautiful and so pure. Like, they're just, like, inseparable. And I love that. And that's what people need to see. Because for me, that's just normal life. But I have friends, families, and other people I know that it's just not like that. They don't have, they're not... They don't have the privilege to have their grandkid, you know, have their grandparents or even their parents or even their father there, right? So it's this conversation that these pictures show without saying it in a way because I'm there. I'm there making the photos with him. His mother's there making the photos with him. And that's what I want to come out because it's what is in the pictures, but it's also what's not in the pictures too that really makes the difference. And I think that's just so powerful. Um, and, you know, I hope he, you know, looks back at these images and the time we spent together, you know, positively, you know, cause so far so good. He, he's pretty open and, and really honestly a collaborator with the work, you know, he's, he's always like, oh daddy, it's, can you get your camera? Let's make a picture. I'm like, yes. And then some days it's like, hey, I'll, you need to sit for this picture, or if you do, I'll give you McDonald's, you know, or ice cream. So I, it has gone to that. I'm not above uh, bribing a child to get what I need. And, I, you know, I sometimes tell them, too, like, hey, man, let's keep this photography thing going because this is going to pay your college tuition, you know. So, you know, he's uh, slowly learning. But the, importantly, though, too, and, and we're starting to have conversations of, like, well, what do these pictures really mean? Because he's at a point where he's still trying to understand that. Like, he's saying, oh, daddy, she's brown, or she's, like, caramel. I'm like, hey, that's good. You know the difference. You know the difference, right? So it's really teaching him different cultures and things um, and how he learns. Um, another, I love this piece. So this piece is called Reflection of Me. And I feel like as a parent, you know, obviously your kids are a reflection of who you are. And for me, it's my goal to try to leave something behind for him, right? Not just like, not that's like land or money, but just, you know, how to live an upright life, how to be respectful, how to treat women, how to, you know, be an upstanding citizen. Like, those are important to me. And those are, you know, partly what I want to leave. Um, faith, you know, things like that. Um, going back to, there's American flag again. So going back to my flag obsession, uh, this is... Um, called It's Complicated. So again, even going back to the other series of military service, again, it's just the whole idea of being black in America is just a complicated conversation, right? And it's just something that is challenging, you know, regardless of where you stand or not, but it's just a challenging conversation and I want people to think about those things and, you know, be willing to have these challenging conversations because a lot of it comes down to just talking. I feel like t today's day and age, like people just don't talk anymore. People can't have a cordial conversation. And I, I want through conversation, you know, through the impact of some of these pictures of just a little black boy living his life, but it's impactful because you just don't see it. You know, those are the things that, you know, I want to get out of this work and people to get out of the work. Um, yeah, we're teaching them how to swim. <laughs> My wife is doing that more than me. And I love this picture, too. This was actually down in, in, in Texas. So uh, this is my brother-in-law and LJ. And I just, yeah, I just love it. Him and his uncle. But again, there's, I mean, there's images that say a lot more than what I even have to say. And I, obviously, this is, and this is the ending image here. I'm, I'm a little over. But um, yeah, this is Easter Sunday. So I don't know. Being, being a black child growing up, Easter Sunday, that's the Sunday that you, whether you go to church or not, you're getting up and you're going to wear the suit. And um, we had that day and he wasn't having it. So I don't know. It just encapsulates like just my experience, right? I, I did that when I was a kid, you know. Um, my friends did that. People can relate. I think overall with the series, whether you're black or white or whatever, everyone has a brother or a sister or a little niece or nephew or whoever, and they grew up with. So I think that's what really helps connect people is that there's still common ground. It just happens that this is a story about a little black boy. 
So that is all. Am I good? Rashad? Thank you so much. Um, and we're going to take 10 minutes for questions and answers. Um, so if you guys have a question, just raise your hand and I'll run the mic to you. Uh, and we just ask that you use the mic to ask your question so the live streamers at home can hear questions and answers. Got one in the back. Hi, thank you for the great talk. Um, this is a question focused to Ron. I really appreciate that you tried to unpack what is good art and what makes art good. Some of the things I agreed with, some of the things I didn't. But what about the artist who is ahead of their time? What about artists that, well, Van Gogh is a perfect example. They're clearly of a different age or a different perspective. I don't think that any of your 26 categories capture the dynamism of someone who's just following their course because they have to. So your question is, what's your question? What about the artists that are not of their time or they're ahead of their time? Well, that, I think one, um, those, those 26 points come off a little bit like a manifesto. And I, th I think what's important to recognize about a manifesto is that it's necessary that you, you disagree and agree with certain parts of it. That's what a manifesto is about. It puts something out there. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm not an art historian. I'm not a theoretician. I'm not even an artist, I don't think. I'm, I'm just lucky to be here. But I, I think your question about, well, what about those who are ahead of their time? You know, I think in the case of Van Gogh, who maybe wasn't appreciated in his lifetime, for me might fit in the category of, like, he's now in the zeitgeist of his time. There's, there's a moment that recognizes him. And it's that moment uh, when he becomes, his, art, his work becomes good. Um, and so certainly they're not, it's, it's, not a, it's not a complete list, it's not even a, not even a good list. It's, it's a list to ponder and think about, but um, I'm definitely going to think about your, your suggestion a little more deeply and think about if that's how, how that factors in or makes its way into this incomplete list of um, thoughts. Thanks. Um, hi. Uh, for both of you, I just wanted to kind of commend um, your talks, because today at lunch we were talking about this whole idea of people have theses, they have the reason why they do their work, but the whole point is to be able to translate it and communicate it, and I feel like both of you guys touch on something that's really important, which are things that we know, that we experience empathy, children, um, imagination, play, and I think that all of the reasons behind those choices are really beautiful, but they're accessible because of the way that you frame them. And that image of your son, uh, specifically with the um, flag, is just really striking, because at the end of the day, we were all children, and I feel like that always touches a chord for people when trying to understand and digest the complexities of race and class and all of these things in the US and just the seesaw too, like all of it. I think it's, it's really beautiful what you guys are able to do with your complex ideas and how you synthesize and communicate them um, and make it so that we can also understand them if we're not familiar with the concepts. Um, let's think here. So, I mean, I appreciate the comment. And the question part was more like, no, just, okay. I appreciate That was beautiful. Thank you. I, I guess I can just add on. I mean, that you hit it right in the head. I mean, that's my plight is just to make art accessible 
and under and people for people to understand because I, I you know I really hated like going to the art museums and seeing like a blob and like people say oh this is this and this I'm like wow like where did you get that from like I don't get it and and granted some art obviously is not supposed to you're supposed to you know gain your own insight but I wanted for me personally wanted to make something that people can connect to right because I'm a connector I love people and connecting and I think that it's important that we all try to reach out, communicate these complex, hard, I mean, they're hard issues that will never, honestly, they'll probably never go away, but I think it makes life a lot more easier when we can have a conversation and just deal with the truth that, you know, you, like I said, I like to say, like, you call a spade a spade, right? And it's things in life that we just have to deal with and we can't, kind of all hide under a rock and not talk about it because it's gonna affect us some way or another. And I just feel like making work like this will at least maybe nudge a little bit, right? Not gonna solve anything really, but just maybe nudge people to maybe have a conversation. Yeah. Thanks, Nefemi. I, 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 sometimes I'm better with questions because I just don't talk too much, but I was, just thinking about Rashad's work, because when I was done, Rashad was like, oh, where do I, you know, where do I fit in oh, there? Yeah. And, you know, I, 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 I think about that. I mean, this list is really maybe for me, but I want to share it as a tool. But I think about, Rashad, how your, your work is so beautifully crafted, if it's in that category. I think it does represent the zeitgeist of the time. I think it teaches us something. Um, I think it knows its audience, too. And, and I think it's really, really beautiful the way you're layering all those kind of attributes that make your art so meaningful. Hey man, you're gonna get me all like emotional <laughs> here. <laughs> Hi, um, I have a question for Ron. Um, the, I'm over here. Uh, you, in your list you said um, well-crafted, or crafted well and, oh, no, craft, well-crafted and designed well. I would love for you to unpack the difference between those two things? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you know, there, there's always a lot of conversation about the difference between art and craft, and I think design is another uh, silo that maybe is, is, is a third silo that people talk about. Uh, for me, the difference is that design solves problems. Um, and, and so what are the problems that design solves when it relates to art? And I, I suggested that piece, um, uh, levita uh, what is it called again? I'm, I'm a little nervous. Levitating um, rock, a big rock at Lacma. Like, like, how do you design the problem, or how do you solve the problem of bringing that rock to Lacma? How do you even, in the work that the workshop participants are doing, they're they're trying to figure out how to do something. For me, that's the design. You have to design the art, even though the art itself isn't designed. Right, design of a building, for example, is how do you accommodate 100 people in a room and they can exit if there's a fire, and there's all these questions about what design is, but sometimes you have to design the thing. And for me, that's different than the making of the thing, the crafting of the thing, how well you put it together, how you're able to manipulate the materials that make that solution or make that thing that may not even have a function necessarily. And so those, to me, are maybe the distinctions between craft and design. Hi. Um, my name is Cassidy. I'm actually in Rashad's class. Um, so this is super awesome. We're all here geeking. Um, but my question is for both of you, actually. Um, I was curious as to how you both think about the role of materiality in and the materiality of your medium um, and how that interacts with and defines the character and impact of your work. Question. Oh, are we good? Let me go first. Uh, so I would say that's a great question. I haven't really thought about that a lot. I think I'll just answer it from like the my wet plate work experience because uh, for me it's really important Oh, can you I use that medium just because of the archivability of it, right? So a, what, a tint type, ambrotype, you know, made properly um, 
will last hundreds of years, like at least 100 years, right? Because we're still looking at the ones from the 1800s. So for me, I wanted that series to be in wet plate because of that. And then also just because of the threads that were prevalent in those times up until today, they're still there. So like an example, you think of, oh, well, where did the police come from? Well, they were called the slave patrol in the South. That's where the police came from, right? So there's a lot of different threads and obviously police are still here, but when you look at the threads of where things come from, it informs you to why they are the way they are today and what and how you have to interact and you know try to have change, but in, in some cases, obviously, some things don't need to be changed, they need to just be abolished, right? But going back to materiality, like you asked me, um, yeah, that that's totally it. It's, it's just more about, I wanted to get back to, the, I think, for me, the seriousness of the topic, I want it to last as long as possible. I want people to look at this while I'm, long and gone, right? I want my son's kids to look at it, right? So. Yeah, good, good question. I, I think a lot about material. Um, it might be central to the work that I do. Um, in, and, I, and I think a lot about the, there's different ways I describe it. Sometimes I describe it as material culture and what a material means uh, in a culture. I just thinking about Rashad's work, like using the materials of a particular uh, time period, like, and using them today, allows us to span the centuries and understand what's happening today and connect them to what happened in the past. I think that's part of material culture. And another is to think about like material ecology, like where materials come from, um, and what that means. Like, are they transported long distances? Do they come from certain places that are accessible or inaccessible to some? And and in the case of the the projects I shown, like the 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 pink teeter totter is made of the same material that the wall is made out of. It's positioned in a different orientation and it's colored a different color. Uh, one orientation makes a barrier to prevent people from coming together. Another orientation makes people engage together, being very intimate. And so that's that's how I think about material in that project and. I have a, a very, like a decades long practice of reintroducing earth as a, as a building material. And, and so it's, it's something that I've been working on for a very long time, but it's really about um, making things with earth as a form of preservation and activism so that the tradition of building with earth that is a, that is a human tradition across the planet uh, does not die. Um, and, and so I, I try to make things with Earth to perpetuate that, those traditions. And those are traditions that are very intimate to my own family history. My family's probably lived in earthen buildings for thousands of years. And so I'm, I, I like to think about Earth as the most advanced uh, building technology on the planet. And I like to think of robots as like the most primitive because we've just been using them for a short time and I've been using robots and they break all the time and they're just really primitive things. But the earth, it sticks, it works, it dries. So, yeah, thanks. Got time for one more question, anybody? All right, thank you guys so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.